Hey there, I'm Andrew Chang. Welcome to About That. Today, uh, maybe one of the largest scale stories we have ever done on this program. We don't often do stories of life and death on this program, but this one counts, I think. The Amazon is burning, like literally burning. And humanity is at something of a crossroads between two futures, one where the Amazon lives and one where the Amazon dies. Now, I remember when I was a kid learning about the Amazon rainforest. It was a bit like learning about some, some mythical, magical kingdom far away that sounded, to be honest, just too fantastical to be real, right? It was, it was in books, it was in cartoons and movies, and I, I always imagined some Indiana Jones type figure, you know, cutting a swath through jungle vines with a machete in, in a place that was just absolutely teeming and buzzing with exotic life. It wasn't until much later that I learned more about why we have, for decades, been so infatuated with, you know, what is, hands down, the largest and most biodiverse tracts of tropical rainforest in the world. Now, the Amazon is twice the size of India. 10% of the world's known species live there. It is the world's most varied biological reservoirs with 20% of the world's flowing fresh water. And it's a massive carbon sink. It's, it's estimated that the plant life there has absorbed 123 billion tons of carbon, both above and below ground. But as I said, it's burning. There's evidence that some parts are emitting more CO2 than they store. The damage over the decades has been catastrophic. You know, by some estimates, the Amazon has lost 20% of its forest cover in the last half century. And every year, well, like, just imagine taking a parcel of rainforest about the size of Toronto and just wiping it out, but not once. Do it 10 or 20 times over. That's what's happening to the Amazon every year. I mean, just, just think about how much land that is, how many trees, how much other life we're talking about here. And so today, the world is asking, who will save it? Now, we can start to answer that question by looking at Brazil. 60% of the Amazon basin is in Brazil, and that country just wrapped up a tightly contested presidential election. The man hoping to cling to power, Jair Bolsonaro, a man who, by many accounts, has allowed the degradation and deforestation of the Amazon to continue. But the man who won the election, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, or people just call him Lula for short, under his rule, the future of the Amazon could look very different. And so, to better understand why and how that is, I caught up with Jill English, CBC's international climate producer, who just recently returned from a trip to the Amazon where she was trying to gain a better understanding of what's at stake. Take a look. Hi, Jill. Hi. How are you doing? Good. We've, uh, we've known each other for so, like several years mm -hmm. now. Yep. I don't think I... I've ever interviewed you before. No, definitely not. This is, <laughs> this <laughs> I don't is the think first. so, yeah. 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 And yeah. It, and you've it, grilled it, me, but you've never I, heard yeah, me. Yeah, 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 I've grilled you off camera as we work together on stories. Yeah. Um, but it's taken you like hopping on a plane, not quite all the way around the world, but it must have felt like that all the way down south to yeah. Brazil. Yeah, well, it was an adventure for sure. And Brazil's a lot further than I realized. Like it sure. took us like 20 hours to get there. We went to the Brazilian Amazon to learn more about the world's biggest rainforest because this amazing place impacts the climate everywhere. That's my teammate, international climate correspondent, Susan Ormiston, who is much less afraid of heights than me, it turns out. Part of our Amazonian adventure took us to a research camp. It was a trek. It was literally in the middle of the Amazon, but the scientists we went with drive this rugged road all the time. That must have been a crazy trip because there's also like the potential for, for danger, right? Yeah. When you go. Yeah, well, in the summer, um, there was a British journalist and his guide who were actually killed doing similar, um, you know, storytelling, environmental kind of storytelling. Right. Uh, they were looking at illegal mining and their bodies were found dismembered and buried um, in, in the forest. Now, Jill and I didn't talk a whole lot about this specific case, but after we were done chatting, how could I not look it up, right? And so here we are, sure enough, three men charged in Brazil rainforest killings of indigenous expert UK journalist, journalist Dom Phillips. Now, 
I'm kind of floored that I, I didn't actually remember that this happened, but apparently this particular area, this part of the Amazon rainforest is known as a hotbed for illegal fishing and poaching. And so really stresses the point that Jill was making about the risk of investigating illegal logging. It's politically very contentious. Um, right now in Brazil, there's a real fight between preserving the forest and developing the forest. And so you've got a lot of um, f farmers and um, agribusiness people who want to continue to clear. Um, and it's illegal what they're doing. And so mm. it, it is something um, we had to take really seriously before we jumped on a plane and went into the jungle. Sure, because yeah, it, like even in the preparation, you must be going through this this balancing act in your mind of how, like how ambitious can we be with the storytelling and who we talk to and where we go versus how judicious should we be about like not taking unnecessary risks and, and being safe. Exactly, yeah. and, it, and it really all comes down to who's with you on the ground because no one speaks English. Hmm. So you're not even able to really pick up Portuguese? on those cues. I don't really speak okay. Portuguese. <laughs> I spent um, four, four months in Portugal <laughs> once, <laughs> no, and so I, yeah, nothing. there's little bits. Yeah. It's not nothing, yeah. but no, I don't speak okay. Portuguese. But I could pick up on little things that were being discussed for sure, right. but that's not enough to, you know, to make those kind of decisions on. So, so you've really got to rely on, on local help that you can find to help kind of keep the, the journalistic train running. When exactly. You're out. Exactly. So in order that when you go to a place like this where you're not from there and you, and you definitely need someone to help you kind of navigate interviews, translate for you, guide you around, find you a taxi. Well, because they're trying to help you, but, but they also have to keep you safe, right? Yes. Like, I mean, do, did you need bodyguards? Bodyguard no, guard? so that was part of the discussion as well. Okay. But part of my conversations with the local journalists and the fixers we were exploring working with was, sh is that a smart move? And everyone local said, not really. Because what's the risk there? What, what's well, the Well, you might draw attention to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. If you're driving through a rural community and you've got bodyguards with you or right. more people with you, um, you might actually be safer with someone who lives in the community, who's your driver and can help kind of suss out what the, you know, yeah. the environment's like uh, in real time. And uh, that's ultimately the decision that we went with that felt the, the best course of action. So you really are relying on your driver and your fixer to yeah. be trustworthy um, and to, to have your back. So l can, we, can we talk a little bit about kind of where it all goes from this point, right? Because, right. I mean, you mentioned the election off the top. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we know the outcome of the election what does that mean for the future of the Amazon? Well, anyone that uh, cared about the Amazon wanted this result. Hmm. Um, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro out, out, Lula in. Lula in. Do you want the future to have the Amazon, indigenous people, and a more colorful community or not? So she says I, Bolsonaro I has neutered environmental protection and encouraged deforestation in the Amazon, up an alarming 70% in his term. We have some scenarios that show that the Amazon would not survive to another four years. So we are going to pass the tipping point of the Amazon. Yeah. Time will tell whether Lula can take on this huge sort of responsibility um, well, under the well, tight timeline. Does time tell us anything? Because he's, he's been president before. He has, and actually deforestation did decrease significantly under mm. his presidency. So there is some evidence to suggest that he will um, have success in right. this if you look at his track record. Ninguém está salvo. A emergência climática afeta a todos embora seus efeitos recaiam com maior intensidade sobre os mais vulneráveis. A desigualdade entre ricos e pobres manifesta-se até mesmo nos esforços para a redução das mudanças climáticas. Por esse motivo, quero aproveitar esta conferência para anunciar que o combate à mudança climática terá o mais alto perfil na estrutura do meu próximo governo. Is, is the promise right now from Lula to protect the, the Amazon, is it ambitious? 
in any way? Is, is there anything that, that he said that would lead us to believe, oh no, this is someone who does actually want to protect this and to preserve it? So that's one thing that uh, Lula has spoken about, was um, just rehabilitating the environmental departments that Bolsonaro sort of gutted that enforce the laws that are mm. already in place. The laws are in place and they have been in place through this whole period, but the problem was the enforcement of them. And so it's not that necessarily he needs to change the laws, but he needs to start honoring them again. Now, this is exactly right, but I should underline that it's hard to overstate how much damage there may be to undo here. So early in his presidency, Bolsonaro actually accused a Brazilian science agency of lying about rising deforestation. And critics say that his tenure has emboldened land grabbers who operate with impunity. You know, one other thing, Jill told me that no fire in the Amazon rainforest is natural. There's no climate change to blame here. All those fires are man-made. And I know you, you don't have a crystal ball, but, but are, are folks optimistic that, that, that there can be change, that these laws that already exist can be enforced? I think they have no choice but to be optimistic because mm. this, they, they had two options. Right. And one, a lot of scientists and environmental advocates would say there was no chance for the Amazon had the result gone the other way. And it was a very close result. It was razor, it was like the margin close. was so thin. Yeah. Now, the exact result was 50.9% for Lula and 49.1% for Bolsonaro. There had been concern leading up to election night that Bolsonaro might not even cede power even if he lost the election. He had been making accusations of electoral fraud before any result had come in. But in the end, what we saw was the narrowest margin of victory ever in history for a Brazilian presidential election. It was the first time a sitting president failed to win a second term. And in the end, it looks like the transition is underway with Lula swearing in set for January 2023. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this uh, will bring hope to them and, and I'm sure there'll be f for their need for activism uh, in order to s still give the Amazon a voice in all this. Because how close to a crisis point are we right now with the future of, of the Amazon? Like if, if because we've all seen elections. We, we've been through enough elections to know that there's a difference between the promise and actual action, right? So if, if, if nothing changes in the next four, four or five years, then what? Um, it will affect all of us yeah. because the, the Amazon is at a point that where they predict a lot of it won't be able to come back. Inside the forest, biologist Marcelo Foronato leads us through singed trees, supposed to be a conservation area. So this was all fire three weeks ago? Yes. A healthy, mature forest was here three years ago, but same pattern, loggers, then fires, pasture is seeded already. How many of these fires are deliberately set? 99% are by criminals. Nobody is licensed to carry out a fire, and they are prohibited by law. It's turning to savanna, um, and once a certain amount of the forest turns to savanna, the entire biome is, isn't able to exist, essentially, in the way that it does. It won't be able to uh, impact, the, or it will impact rain patterns in different ways. It will impact ocean currents in different ways. And ultimately, the thing that, I guess, is is an easy thing to keep in mind is how much carbon the forest holds. As you clear it and burn it, you're releasing that carbon back into the atmosphere. So not only are the trees not there to take in the carbon dioxide, but they're also re-releasing Everything more. that over the, the hundreds and thousands of years that the forest has been, it's all... It's coming. all going right back out. So yeah. that is, uh, I guess, the big concern here is that, you know, we need that forest globally to influence our climate. And um, if we start getting rid of it, then that will have catastrophic effects. So Jill, can I, can I end with a question that, that maybe I should have started with, but, but that I think works as a final question. What is it that you and, and Susan 
set out to do in doing this story? And, and do you think you accomplished it? Hmm. I mean, I think we set out to, sh to show um, the connection between what's, what's happening in people's lives, the choices that they have, the choices they don't have, and climate change. And so with the election, we, we all need to be watching things like this to see what the Brazilians are deciding because it, it does have a very direct impact on Canadians. And I think that's what we wanted to shed some light on and also show some of the tensions and why they exist. I think all in all, for us, it was a success. And I guess it's just hopefully people took something from it as well, learned something from it. Well, Jill, I'm glad you're home safe and sound. Me too. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Now, since we did that interview several weeks ago, Lula was officially sworn in as president, his election win certified by Brazil's electoral court. He also attended this year's COP27 climate conference in Egypt. And, you know, he, he reaffirmed that his priority would be to fight deforestation in the Amazon. Now, whether Lula will actually turn things around for the world's largest rainforest, we, we just don't know. But the stakes couldn't be higher. Okay, we'll be right back uh, after this short break with a sneak peek at what we've got coming up for the rest of the week. Hey there, welcome back to About That, and, and uh, Happy New Year. <laughs> I guess I should have said that at the start of the show. Um, now, to, start, to mark the start of 2023, we are going to be doing something a little bit different on the program for the rest of this week. Um, because, you know, so much of the past few weeks have been about reflections, right, on the year that was. So we wanted instead to look forward to what's to come. Now, we're not in the business of predicting the future, but there is a lot that 2022 can tell us about 2023. So we've pulled together some of our friends uh, to delve into what this new year might hold. And here's a sneak peek at some of what's to come. I have Donovan Bennett uh, joining me right now. So we've got a lot of clips and a lot of material to get through. To scapegoat hockey as a centerpiece for toxic culture. With the brain and down he goes. The greatest of all time. Some miscommunication. It's in! Canada on this most memorable of days have put four past Jamaica. Canada is going to the World Cup! We're going to have eight teams to start. Four in the East, four in the West. There needs to be a future, and we see far too many young girls dropping out of sports, and hopefully this can, can help change that. Gosh, it, this took a long time to get to this point. I mean, it's been a long time coming. Too long. But women, ledly, looking for women investors, women owners, but backed by the corporate sector. I do think that that is going to be the trailblazer where we're going to see other leaks come and follow the same template. Okay, so what what should we uh, what should we type in? Whew. Now that's a hard start already. Jeez. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? I mean, what would work? All right, how about uh, a jar of peanut butter, arm wrestling, a tub of yogurt? Do you actually get something? We're, about to, we're about to find out. I'm, I'm going to go a little more uh, straightforward here. An oil painting of a daisy lying on a table. We are here with Joshua Kane, tech writer with The Globe and Mail, to talk about artificial intelligence and where we see that whole thing uh, landing in 2023. So, so there, are, there are limitless sort of applications of mm -hmm. AI as they relate to real people and as they relate to businesses. We have a little game. In each row, there is one piece of art that was actually human created. Mm -hmm. The rest are AI attempts. He's gonna say that one. You're so. gonna say that? AI. In the past year, the ways that the average person can access AI and to actually sort of see the tangible results of prompting it with information yeah. and getting, you know, really interesting results. 
that's here now. I mean, we see it solving a lot of problems, but also creating a lot of problems. Yeah, when you disrupt an industry, when you disrupt creativity, there are going to be people who are, are left behind. And when you make assumptions with any technology, as AI does, then you're also gonna enter some pretty thorny ground. We're gonna play a game. Okay. Oh, the, these are impressive, by the way. They are. Uh, like pop culture ransom like notes. <laughs> oh, that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking like 1996 scrapbook, but sure. Andrew's gonna choose a card and he's gonna read what's on the back of the card. And each one represents a trend that we think is important to pay attention to in the coming year. Okay. And maybe it'll be a trend that we like and we're into. Maybe it'll be a trend that we think is super problematic. You have to guess. Eat the rich on TV. Here they are, the Rebel Alliance. I've seen a lot of guys who like make all this money and they just start acting different. There's this like class consciousness, this mm -hmm. idea that we're going to use pop culture to think a little bit more deeply about wealth. The return of live music and big tours. Yeah, what do you think, good or bad? <clears throat> so, I, so, good. I think overwhelmingly good. I mean, my understanding has always been this is kind of how they do make their money. Um, and so, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna stop talking. No, and, you're, you're uh, not. Your thought process is perfectly logical. Okay. I just think you're it's wrong. Just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's gonna be a good week. I can feel it. Okay, uh, we will be back after this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one more thing about Brazil. Uh, that'll be my final thought. Just. Hey there. Okay, so um, as far as Brazil and the Amazon goes, you know, I just wanted to say that there is a lot that we have discussed in this episode, but also a lot that we haven't, right? So, you know, our focus was, was very intentionally on what our journalists learned and uncovered on the ground in the Amazon. Now, there is an inevitable crossover with politics. And, and you know, Brazil's politics, sort of like all politics, are, are incredibly complex. And we would need an entire other episode to talk about all of the developments since Jill's trip to the Amazon. You know, we could talk about Bolsonaro's silence for, for weeks after the election that he lost. You know, his refusal to concede defeat, his ambiguous comments to supporters who, who seem in favor of a military coup as a way of Bolsonaro reclaiming power. You know, or, or Bolsonaro's insistence that his supporters continue to protest outside army bases, specifically. I mean, the, the, the torching of police vehicles, the, the attacks on police infrastructure. Like, so the list goes on, right, as we now know. There is so much more to talk about in Brazil. But again, I just wanted to say that that's something for another show, another time. There is so much more to discuss. But thank you for watching us on this program. I hope you found it helpful and informative. Thanks for watching. Take care.